All right, I'm a last minute sub. So if you were expecting another talk, this is what you're getting. I apologize. Um, hello and welcome. So this talk is uh, simple tweaks to get the most out of your JVM. We'll also be covering a, a broader discussion on current JVM technology. Make sure my clicker's working. So first, an introduction. Again, my name is Rich Haggerty. I'm a developer advocate at IBM, uh, focused on Java runtimes. Um, my previous life, I was in software development for about 25 years. And I'd like to start with a little story. So back in the day, early 2000s, I think, I was on a, uh, a new team, and we were starting at a project, and we were going to use this new language called Java. And I think back then it was like version 1.3, 1.4. Um, but we picked Java because of the language itself. It was object-oriented. We were C++ folks, so it was object-oriented, which we liked. It didn't have the pointer issues, which we didn't like. Um, and as far as the JVM, we knew it was there. We knew there might be performance issues. But we always knew we had a solution. And does anyone want to know what, know what that solution is? Does anyone know what that solution is? How do we get around performance issues back then in the 2000s? No one? No one wants to guess? More hardware, right? Faster hardware, more RAM. That's how we did it. But as we're going to discuss today, as we move into cloud-native environments, that's not the best solution. In fact, we want to use less resources. We want to be more efficient. So let's get started. So what are we going to be looking at today? Um, we're going to talk about what a JVM is and, and why it's important. Then we're going to talk about how the cloud has changed everything and what we want to look for in a JVM. We'll talk about some of the more uh, popular JVMs out there and compare them. Um, picking the right runtime. This is just as important as picking your JVM. You want to pick a runtime that complements the features that you're trying to expose in your JVM. We'll go over some, some tweaks to your JVM to make it help run more efficiently. And then we're going to talk about OpenJ9 JVM specific features, such as uh, shared class cache, idle tuning, and JIT server. Then we'll talk about some feature, future technology that may change the way JVMs work. So let's get started. So some of this is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you guys know all this, but for completeness, bear with me. Let's just get through a couple slides. Um, so why is the JVM important? Obviously, without the JVM, there is no Java. OK, what exactly does the JVM do? Of course, it's the lifeblood for Java developers. It converts your bytecode to machine code so it can run on the host system. That's the whole point. It's the portability. Um, that's where the slogan comes from, one, uh, write once, run anywhere. Right? So um, if you change your architecture, you just change out the JVM. Your Java code stays the same. So why do people use JVMs? Um, Cross-platform, again, runs, run once. Write once, run anywhere. Um, large library ecosystem. It's been around for over 25 years. There's tons of support. There's tons of frameworks. It has all the, all the major vendors support it. Um, great garbage collector, so it runs very efficiently. Um, powerful monitoring and tracing tools to help you isolate bottlenecks, find issues in your JVM. And it's uh, proven and robust. So how does a JVM work? Again, this is from a very, very high level. Um, so we have three subsystems that interact with each other. We got the um, class loader subsystem, the runtime data area, and the execution engine. So the class loader um, subsystem basically has three phases. We have loading, linking, and initialization. That um, loading phase is what loads all your Java bootstrap and your library extension files and your application itself. Um, and that's also the biggest bottleneck during startup. So we're going to talk about ways to make that a more efficient. And the rest of that is all about the linking initialization is all about verifying your bytecodes correct and initializing your variables and setting those up. 
So your runtime data area, this is all around uh, your memory allocating and managing that while your application is running. Um, we have the stack for all your local variables, and then we have the heap for your global variables. Um, it also has PC registers to keep track of all your threads and what the currently, uh, your current instruction that's being executed is. So the execution engine, this is a part that uh, obviously executes your Java application. So there's two main components here. We have the interpreter and the JIT compiler. So the interpreter takes that bytecode and, and interprets it one line at a time which is very inefficient, very slow. And if you have methods that are called repeatedly, it's going to reinterpret those methods every time. So very suboptimal. That's where the JIT compiler comes into play to the rescue. Um, it could take some of that bytecode, convert it into machine code, execute it a lot faster. Then you might be wondering, how does the JVM determine what to compile, what not to compile? So it uses heuristics. It has profilers. So it's going to find those hot spots that it is pegged to be, this is what we need to, to uh, compile to, to get this uh, application to perform the best. So how has the cloud changed the JVM? So the dollar signs is a hint. Um, so another story from the old days. So I, would, I, would be, um, I was a developer, so I'd say, can I, my IT guy, I'd say, hey, can I get a, a test system? Next thing you know, there's a big old server gets delivered, over-provisioned, a lot of resources. I would use that for a couple weeks. Hey, do you have a build system? I get another system. And after three or four years, I have all these systems underneath my desk, all plugged in. I'm not using them, but they keep my feet warm in the winter and a total waste of resources. That IT guy, I don't know how he kept track, but he never came back and got those. Um, from a company standpoint, from a total resource standpoint, very inefficient obviously. So today, the world is a lot different. So with the cloud, everything is now visible, and it's measurable. So that same IT guy now goes to his cloud dashboard, and he knows exactly how much money I'm wasting. Because I've provisioned VMs, I've deployed applications, they all show up in a dashboard, um, how many CPUs I'm using, how, many, how much RAM, how much disk space, and you, you know, I'm spending $100 a month. I get a report, and I have to be aware of that. If I ignore it, my boss gets the report. He's in charge of a department, so obviously very visible, um, and there's a, a, a focus now, a laser focus in companies to, to drive down these costs. That's the whole point of going to the cloud. Right? They wanted to get rid of the, the closets full of hardware, Let's get some, uh, some cloud and some management around that. So again, here's an old data center view. The, the, the dark color is the resources that are needed. The blue is there just in case, right? So that just in case resource is always being wasted 99% of the time. So in a cloud environment, we have a little more granularity. Right, we have two big benefits. We don't have to pay for that just-in-case resource. And, um, and we could free that up for others. So again, less resources, less energy, save money. Now we take it one step further. In the world of microservices and containers, we have even more granularity. We could take things up and down and, and save a ton of resources, and we could really focus on those smaller units of, of uh, energy that we're now using. Um, so again, the theme, less resources, less uh, energy, more savings. So with microservices, for example, and containers, there is a negative. For every one of those containers, we now have to run a JVM, right? So. Now that, that, that focus has changed, that par it's a paradigm shift. It used to be JVM providers said, I want to be the fastest, I want to support the, the most platforms. Oh, now I got to be quick and I got to be small. So these are new metrics that they care about. So JVM providers now have, a, have to balance a new set of metrics and there is no right answer. They could focus on one 
not on some others, whatever they think is the most important that developers need. Right, so here are the metrics. We have startup time. That's the time it takes for your service to service its first request. We have ramp up time. That's the time that it takes for your service to be totally um, optimized. That means any memory it needs to allocate is, is allocated. Any um, methods that need to be compiled have been compiled. You're ready to roll. Um, memory footprint, how much, how much actual memory is your JVM taking in the container? Um, response time, how fast does your microservice, for example, respond to a request? And of course, we have, always have to have high CPU throughput. And we need to balance all these, and there is no the right or wrong way. And again, you focus on one, you may have a negative effect on the other. So does anyone remember this? This was uh, one of the first phones that had Java on the inside, right? So they actually created a new version of Java. I think it was J2ME, the micro edition. So it had to be very small to run in that phone. And it also um, had to be, to be successful as a phone. Obviously, it had to be very responsive. It had to be quick and responsive. If, if you had a three-second uh, talk delay, that wouldn't work. So, um, and basically, a phone running Java uh, ME is basically like a container running a JVM. Um, so for the phone to work, um, it obviously needs to run in a very small footprint. And of course, to be successful, it needs fast startup, and it needs to be immediately uh, responsive. Now let's take a look at the cloud and containers, and we sort of have the same issue, right? We obviously have more resources, we can, but we want the same results. We want the same results. We want a small footprint, we want to be a, a very fast startup, and we want immediate uh, responsiveness. And again, the, uh, back to that theme, less resources, less energy, save money. OK, why should developers care um, about saving resources? Is it really that big a deal? So let's take, at, uh, take a look at it from an energy consumption perspective. So there are over 500,000, this is of 2019, by the way, there are over 500,000 data centers worldwide. This does not include um, any Bitcoin uh, mining. Um, the area of land uh, they consume is around the size of 6,000 football pitches. By the way, does anyone know how to translate that to American? Soccer fields, soccer fields, that's the answer. Um, anyway, the, um, the amount of energy used is one and a half times the total energy output by the, uh, for the UK, which is staggering if you think about it. And the trend is getting worse, right? Luckily, we have to give a shout out to the hardware engineers have, have helped with this. They flattened the curve a little bit with their efficiencies in, in, in hardware design, have really made a change. Um, you notice that that was spiking straight up, so they've done their part. Now it's up to software engineers to do their part um, with making things more efficient. And how do we do that? Well, the, the, the JVM is a good place to start. That's what we're going to learn today. And of course, there are a lot of JVMs. Did everyone know that there are a lot of JVMs? I talked to one person, they thought, uh, there's one JVM, right? That's what you get. You get what you get. Um, so there's a, a lot of JVMs for um, a lot of use cases. Uh, you probably heard of several of these, and some are very obscure. Um, like one, Maxine, this pointer working? Oops, wrong thing I picked there, sorry. I'll get back on tune here. I apologize. Um, one is Maxine. Um, that was kind of, it was uh, developed over 20 years ago, but it had some characteristics for cloud-native environments, and uh, it was way ahead of its time, and that's actually the basis for Graal VM, which just came out a couple years ago, so pretty interesting. And that, of course, GraalVM is, is becoming very, very popular. Um, 
Let's take a look at some of the more popular JVMs. Of course, um, you know you get your JVMs from JDK distributions. And all the JDKs come with uh, the open JDK binaries. Um, and most JDKs come with Hotspot. That is the default since version, uh, I think, 1.3. Um, that's the default. And so all of the distributions that you can go to to get your, your JDK have that, the, the open JDK binaries and the Hotspot JVM. That includes from Amazon, uh, Oracle, uh, Adopt Open uh, JDK, um, Azul. There's, uh, there's other distributions from Azul, GraalVM. So Eclipse Open J9 is the oddball, not based on Hotspot. And we're going to get into more of this later. But it is also, uh, it's only available through one distribution, and that is through the IBM Samaru runtimes. So we'll talk about this again. Hint, I'm from IBM, so that's where we're heading soon. So speaking of popular JVMs, let's go through a couple of these. The ones I think people care about, hopefully. So first we have Open uh, Hotspot, I'm sorry, was first developed in 1999. Um, by Sun. Um, it became the default um, JVM in 1.3, yes. Um, and it was open sourced in 2006, which was a big deal. So that allowed companies and researchers to grab those binaries and play with them and experiment with them. And it led to a growth in, in JVM providers. That was the big catalyst going open source. Um, and just to let you know, the hotspot there, we already talked about it earlier. Hotspots that those areas of the code that are being repeated that probably need to be compiled. That's where it got its name. Now we have OpenJ9. So OpenJ9 is open source and governed by the Eclipse Foundation. So OpenJ9 started life as the J9 JVM. It was developed by IBM about 20 years ago. And it was a part of all of IBM's Java-based products. And over that time, it's been used by all the Fortune 500 companies to run their enterprise applications. So it has a long history of success. Um, and about five years ago, it, along with Open Liberty, um, was open sourced by IBM. The largest contribution, uh, open source contribution in IBM's history. We're talking millions and millions of lines of code. So. But even though it was open source, IBM is still the main contributor to both OpenJ9 and Open Liberty and trying to get it optimized for cloud-native environments. So we get some graphs. Let's see what we got here. I want to point to that one. I'm going to see if this works. Does that work? Pretty, kind of? Um, so this is a comparison of um, OpenJ9 versus Hotspot. So OpenJ9 is in green, Hotspot's in orange. And I can't read from over there, so let me read the slide here. So the first one is 51% faster startup time, which is important for microservices starting and stopping. Um, it's got a 50% smaller uh, footprint after startup. Uh, remember, JVMs are included in every container, so you want it to be as small as possible. It's got faster ramp up time. Remember what ramp up time was? It's fully optimized, ready to roll. So it, it gets there quicker. OpenJ9 gets there quicker than, than um, Hotspot. And then finally, the last graph, uh, when it's all said and done and everything's running smoothly, it's, it's handling requests, we're still taking up 33% less uh, footprint than Hotspot. So with OpenJ9, you get a uh, more efficient cloud-native um, applications and microservices, according to these graphs. And it only gets better the more services you, you, you are running at the same time. So next is GraalVM, which was released in 2019 based on Maxine, which I mentioned previously. So there, there's a lot of um, JVMs out there. This one is very unique. So the key to Graal is that it compiles everything ahead of time. That's its claim to fame. All AOT, it's all there. Um, but it's, so it's focused, it's, it's, very, it's got great um, startup time, and it's very small. So it's focused on those two metrics. 
I'm not sure how it does on the other three. Um, so that's something you should know about and you should test these things out. Um, the other interesting part about um, Graal VM is it, it, it's, it supports polygot applications. Does anyone know what polygot applications are? No guess? That's multiple languages in, in one application. So it supports, obviously, Java, it's C, uh, JavaScript, to name a few. Also Python. Um, again, the Graal VM project goals, um, they're very ambitious. They want to be as fast as native languages like C. Um, they want to continue support of multiple languages, so they want to expand that list of languages that are run in their JVM. And they want to have the, the uh, smartest uh, startup times through use of AOT. All right, picking the right runtime. Like we mentioned, you, you've done your homework, you've figured out what JVM is best for your needs. Now you've got to pick a runtime that's, that's appropriate, that best highlights the features that you, of your JVM running underneath. So we're going to look at a couple of, of runtimes. Surprise, surprise, the first one's Open Liberty, which was open sourced um, by IBM five years ago with the OpenJ9 JVM. And it was specifically built for cloud-native technologies. So uh, Liberty focuses on developers. It has this concept of just enough application server. So you can load everything, or you can load almost nothing, just the feature that you want. So it scales up and down very well. It has dev mode, um, which is where you can make changes to configuration your code. Uh, and the server will just keep restarting and sucking that up without you having to do any intervention. That's what dev mode is. Um, it implements and supports the latest releases of the uh, Java Enterprise, Jakarta EE, and MicroFofile APIs, and Spring. Um, zero migration means if you ever upgrade those APIs, um, no changes made on your code. And it's cloud ready which means it's uh, optimized to run in containers and in CI-CD environments. And all the characteristics you want for running in the cloud, which is small footprint, efficient uh, memory uh, usage, and fast startup, et cetera. Um, like we mentioned, it's just enough application server. So here's an example. You can, you can full, uh, pull in the full API for Jakarta or just a single feature. Totally up to you. So this allows it to run very small, and it's very scalable. So API support, it's the first to support uh, Jakarta EE uh, eight, 7 and 8, and also oh, 8 and 9, I'm sorry, and uh, MicroProfile versions 1 through 5. And it'll continue to support. That's, that's a big goal of uh, Open Liberty, is to be the, the first and uh, to support all of those uh, standards. Next, we'll talk about Corcus that comes from Red Hat. Um, and this was designed specifically for cloud native technologies. I need to get a drink, I'm sorry. So, Corcus uh, is similar to Liberty. Um, Liberty, it can be small and streamlined for your. Um, use case. It supports native execution, so this works very well with Graal VM. In fact, you see it teamed a lot that way. And it supports lots of libraries, including MicroProfile. So here's a couple more graphs to drive home the point. Here's Quarkus uh, with Graal VM in green, Quarkus with Hotspot in blue, and a typical setup in gray. And you can see that the Quarkus plus Graal VM has a very, uh, very impressive um, um, footprint and, and ramp up speed. But again, remember, they focus on those two metrics. There are others. Just keep that in mind. And of course, there's a number of other runtimes run out there. Um, and also, what's interesting in the container world, you can run all of these at the same time, communicating with each other in different containers. So that can happen. So tweaking the JVM. 
Let's get into some of this. So getting the most out of your JVM, I'm just going to go through these one at a time. And we're going to talk more about a couple of these. But one um, is actually job number one is writing efficient code. That's very obvious, but there are a couple of things we could talk about here. Two is use the right JVM for your needs and picking the right runtime. I think we've already discussed that, why that's important. Um, using profiling to get the most out of your JVM. So you, there are some really cool profilers out there that can really help you isolate bottlenecks and understand what's going on under the covers. And then uh, tweaking your JVM depending on your needs, whether you're in development or production or whether you're running locally or in a container. So let's discuss some of this. Number one, writing efficient code. Um, so there's a lot of information out there, and these are the obvious ones, but we'll go through them. Um, use primitives where possible. Of course, we want to use lowercase int instead of uppercase integer. We always want to put, um, use the stack instead of the heap because um, big integer is, is just a wrapper class. Um, we have uh, use a, a string buffer, string builder rather than a string buffer. Um, String builders a lot more, uh, less resources, but it's not thread safe, so you still may need to use uh, string uh, buffer. Don't use iterators. This is kind of controversial, but uh, there are some cases where you don't want to use them. They, they are uh, resource heavy. Um, avoid using big integer and big decibel. This one's very obvious. You never want to use resources unless you absolutely need them. Um, use, and getting to, back to using the right JVM for your needs. Um, so there's, uh, we're going back to how you get distributions of, the, of, of your JVM through JDKs. So I wanted to talk about this a little bit. So every vendor has their own distribution site. I'm picking one here. It's called uh, Adopt Open JDK. They're kind of the keeper of the Open JDK binaries. And they have a way that you can go out there and select the, um, you get, get your supported platform and your, your versions and that kind of thing for all the, uh, all the different platforms. But um, again, Amazon has their own version. Oracle has their own way of doing this. Um, this one actually is, is going away. So Adopt OpenJDK, um, it became too much for them to handle, so they are, they're moving to Eclipse. So the new, the new site is now called Adoptium. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. But that's the new website, and um, actually, I think tomorrow they're releasing the Adoptium Marketplace. So you can go to Adoptium. They'll have a tile for every vendor that has a JDK distribution, and you can click on those and get their stuff straight from there. So it's one-stop shopping. So it's pretty cool. Again, that's happening, I think, tomorrow. But Adopt Open JDK will be going away. So I did want to talk about this. Um, I, I talked about the OpenJ9 being only available from the IBM distribution. So let's go over that real quick. So IBM Samaru Runtimes is the IBM JD, OpenJDK distribution. Now, you're probably thinking, Samaru, what, what is that? So it's, it's actually pretty clever. Samaru is the tallest mountain on the island of Java. See? We see where I'm going with that? And the best part is above the clouds. So it's actually pretty clever from a marketing standpoint. But anyway, so it's called IBM Samaru Runtimes. It's the only one that gives you um, the Open JDK JVM. All right? Um, and there's two editions. There's a certified edition, which will be available from Adoptium Marketplace. And there's an open ed edition. They're both free to download. The only difference is licensing. I think the certified has an IBM license. The other one has a GPL. Um, also, support uh, supported platforms. You probably want to get the open version. That supports Mac and Windows and all the favorite the little Linux uh, flavors. And so I would recommend going straight. If you're interested and you want to check it out, go to um, ibm.com slash Samuel Runtimes to get your download. You, like I said, you can go to Adopt a Marketplace starting tomorrow, but you're only going to get the certified version. And it may not support. If you've got a Mac, you're out of luck. And also, um, for containers, you can get it from the IBM Container Registry and from Docker Hub. All right. So this is pretty cool. This is uh, picking the right, um, the right runtime for your application. So this graph 
Um, at the bottom is the architectural style. So we're going from monolith to microservice and functions. Um, so what we're trying to indicate here is what's the proper type of, of runtime you would want to use for those, that particular type of architecture style. So monolith, if anyone doesn't know, that's a word meaning old Java program. Big, that did everything, right? Um, that's a monolith. Um, WAS, I don't know if anyone's aware, that's called, that's short for, um, does anyone know? Does anyone remember that? Just WebSphere Application Service, that's it. And that's 20-year-old application server, uh, very successful. Like I said, run every Fortune 500 companies run all their uh, enterprise software on it. It's great for what it does. It handles monoliths. It's huge. It's four gig. It takes a half hour to start. You don't want to run your microservices on it. Um, but it handles that. That's that part. So we move along. We're going to um, the next one is Open Liberty. Like we said, it's very scalable, very small, very large. It can handle monoliths, and it can also scale down to handle, to handle microservices. Um, and the term macro, uh, macro services, does everyone understand what that is? So there's this trend to go, to use it in cloud, to go from a monolith application to a one that is uh, run by microservices. And there's a path along that migration path, right? And at some point, they get to a, um, they might have a couple of services. They say, hey, these are prime for being separate microservices, but they're so tightly coupled, we can't break them up right now. So we're going to stick them together as one service for the time being. That's called a mic macro service. So Open Liberty covers that whole gamut from monolith down to microservice. And then we have Quarkus down at the bottom right there, which was designed specifically for um, microservices. Next, we talk about profilers. Um, again, there's been some great advances made in profilers, um, and they can be really useful uh, to diagnose problems or just to understand how the JVM works. Here's a list of the, uh, some of the more popular profilers. And I, I really do recommend, as a developer, if you're a Java developer, you, you should really look into these, understand what's happening under the covers. So tweaking your JVM. So let's see what we're going to do here. Um, tune your garbage collector. Um, there's lots of way to ways to do this um, to make it more efficient. We're not going to go into that, but that's available. Um, using an AOT compiler like Graal VM does um, can improve the performance of your applications, especially at startup time. Um, and that's available in most JVMs. I know it's available in the Hotspot and OpenJ9. Um, class cache sharing, idle tuning, and JIT server, the next three items, um, those are features of, uh, that we're going to talk about with OpenJ9 JVM that can really um, help out uh, your application. So we'll get into those in more in detail. The last item listed there is heap size. We always obviously want to start small, grow it as you need it, always do load testing, find out what you need, don't over provision heap, get what you need. So let's, let's talk about a couple of these, um, these open J9 features. Now, like I said, it, it may, uh, the feature may be available in other JVMs, but we're going to talk about it from the perspective of open J9. Um, so idle tuning. It's, it is what it sounds like. So first, we're going to show you uh, some graphs of, of open J9 without any idle tuning just to show you how well it, it manages memory in general, right? So we have um, OpenJ9 in blue, and I think we got, let's see, uh, I can't even read that, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if it's a hotspot or, I think it is, hotspot in red. Yeah, so it's running an Acme Air application, which is one of those test Java applications you always run to, to, to test things to see uh, how they're running. Um, and as you can see, the, it's pretty even uh, when you have a, enough room. Um, but as you get larger, you'll see the hotspot takes advantage and actually uses all that space when it doesn't need to. So um, OpenJ9 uses half the memory in a 4-gig uh, container. 
and, and bo basically because it does a good job of recycling memory after it gets done with compiles, et cetera. It frees up that, that net memory. Now with open, uh, with um, idle tuning, it takes it one step further. So you'll see the, uh, it's just a JVM parameter, dash XX idle tuning GC online, idle on idle. Um, so this graph is very hard to read. I was questioning whether I should include it, but the bottom has, has some idle spans, those little red. God dang it. I can always hit the wrong one. I apologize. There it is. So those little dashes, that's idle times. And if you go straight up, you'll see that um, both in, um, in Java heap and process memory, it is reducing the amount of memory it needs. So basically, your service has gone idle or sleep mode. So it frees up that memory. Um, again, all this, that's a little bit, but all this helps to save resources and uh, save money. Now we have the OpenJ9 JIT server. Now this particular feature is only available to OpenJ9, and it's my favorite feature, because you get a lot of bang for your buck with this. So basically everyone understands how JIT server or the JIT compiler works in your JVM. Basically what the JIT server is, is a JIT as a service. So you can run the JIT compiles remotely in another container or as a service. And you offload that task from each container. So here's an example. Um, we have two JIT servers running remotely um, and servicing three JVMs, all with their JIT requests. And it's managed um, with balance, load balance through the orchestrator. So even though those three JVMs have a JIT compiler in them, it's not using them. One of those graphs that's hard to see again, but what we have here is, um, in this case, we have OpenJ9 in, two, uh, two in both cases. In the red, it's uh, running just OpenJ9. The blue one is running with the JIT server. Now, as and you're going left to right, you're getting less and less resources. So on the left side, we have enough resources where it doesn't make that big a difference. The JVM is large enough, it can handle it, it can do its own compiles, it's fine. And it gets, starts to struggle a little bit as you, as, you, as you lower the size. And then finally, we have the smallest container, and you can see the red line, which is just OpenJ9, has kind of basically fallen over. Okay, the number one reason containers fail is from memory spikes, CPU spikes during JIT compiles. So the blue one is running like nothing's happening, right? Like it has tons of resources, because it does. It is offloading all the JIT compiles to the server. So here's another interesting graph that's going to take me a second to explain. Um, so we, have, we had a test case. We were running OpenShift, uh, Red Hat OpenShift on AWS, and we have four applications, four test applications, and we had three worker nodes to run this, and they were all 12 gig a piece, right? And we said, okay, get your applications, those four applications, up and running efficiently. We want replication across nodes, Get it working, let's see what you got. So that's the result at the top. And you'll see that we use three nodes. The colors represent an application. So like for example, the yellow one, it's been replicated uh, six times. I can't read that far, um, eight times. And the size of the, the box is actually telling you how large of JVM it is relative to the others, okay? So we got it running, top one, we got three nodes. We got our container set. It's all running efficiently. Everything's fine. The bottom one, we run with a JIT server. And the JIT server, you can see, is in brown. So we made it kind of large. We put a JIT server in each of the nodes. And then we replicated the applications to the same extent, the same number of replications per application. But if you notice, the size of the containers is a lot smaller. That's because we now no longer have to worry about just in case with those containers. We don't have to worry about the spikes that are going to come from the CPU and the memory compiling the, 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 the Java code. So we can make them all smaller. They're more compact. We, even with the JIT servers, we're down to two nodes. 
So we just saved 33% of our cost. And of course, this is real, uh, it's easy to enable. It's just a, a JVM uh, option. And just to let you know, the JIT server is actually just another openj 9 JVM, but it's running under a different persona. So nothing special going on there. Um, class data sharing is the last feature I want to talk about real quick. Um, so what is class sharing? Um, it's shared memory, which means multiple JVMs can access it. It's persistent, which means it, it sticks around even if the JVM goes away. Um, the size of the cache can be specified, but it can't grow any larger. So there's some of the rules there. Um, and when you turn it on in OpenJ9, you automatically get AOT enabled. Um, so how does it work? So the first case, without shared cache, Remember we talked about the class loader subsystem? What's going to happen when it loads classes? It goes to the class loader cache, then it goes to the parent, and if it doesn't find it, it goes to the file system. That's what takes all the time. Um, when you have class um, sharing turned on, we have an extra step. The shared class cache is step three. That's where most of the time it's going to find the, the, the class, and so it saves time there. And again, the same, so you load it once with one JVM, any other subsequent JVMs can access the same one. And also, just, um, I just wanted to talk about this real quickly. Did I just change it? Um, so some people have questions about AOT versus JIT compile, right? So what's the difference? And the biggest difference is the timing of when it occurs and the optimizations that can take place because of that timing. Right? So when you compile something ahead of time, like Grawl VM does with all the classes, you don't know the end environment where it's going to run on. So you can only make so many assumptions. Right? When, you JIT, when you compile with a JIT compiler, you're actively running the container. It knows exactly what's happening in the environment. So I've heard estimates of it's about 10% more optimized when you, when you use JIT compiler than over AOT. Okay, easy to, I know I'm running out of time here, so I, I, can, I know you guys are hungry. Um, so enabling is easy. It's obviously just some more JVM options. Let's get going here. Um, startup time, comparison, again, we're using uh, Open Liberty runtime using Hotspot. And you can see Open Liberty starts in two seconds. And we got some other of the bigger uh, runtimes running. When we got OpenJ9 shared class cache on, turned on, so Open Liberty is, is cut in half. But you also notice all the other runtimes are also faster. So it can help with all the other runtimes. It's not just Open Liberty. And from, from a container uh, perspective, it's, it's a lot more efficient. Um, real quick, I just I have to mention this. Um, so Open Liberty and Open J9, like I mentioned, are both open sourced by IBM five years ago. So there is a synergy between the two. They're both open source projects. IBM is still the main contributor to both. And so they work together to ensure that they get as optimized as possible. So there is some advantage um, of working together with, between those two technologies. I was going to show a demo, but I'm not going to do that. So how about the future? Anyone uh, wonder if any new technologies are coming out there? I'm going to assume you said yes. Tell us more. Here we go. Um, I'm actually going to talk about one. It's called CryU. So it stands for Checkpoint Restore in User Space. So this is all about reducing that startup time. So this is technology that already ex exists in Linux. It's basically checkpoint restore. So you take, a check you take a checkpoint of your system at some point, and then if it ever fails, you reboot. You can always restart back from that spot. So that same concept is going to be used, at least uh, that's the theory, that's going to be used um, with containers. And this is a feature of, again, OpenJ9 with Liberty. So it's actually both of them combining to, to solve this issue together. That's going to be coming out next year. 
oh, actually, the end of this year. There are a couple issues they're still working through. Oh, never mind, I've got to go to this slide first. This is just telling you the difference. As you can see, the blue is without cryu, the orange is with. So the larger the application, the more significant it is. As you can see, day trader seven application, it goes from four seconds to uh, less than half a second. Uh, there are some challenges with the cryu that need, still need to be resolved. It's the reason it's not released right now. Uh, there's no encryption support. It, uh, you have to run as root, which isn't good in containers. Um, and they need to create a functional set of APIs so it could be called and restarted. Um, so that kind of ends the talk, but I want to go through a recap here of what we should have learned. I don't know if I explained it correctly, but um, let's go through this real quick. One, do your part as a uh, developer, write efficient code. Pick the right JVM and runtime that best fits your um, application. And if your code can run with less resources, take advantage, do that. Um, use profiling and find bottlenecks or issues um, and make your code more efficient. And lastly, take advantage of the JVM features uh, to improve efficiency and reduce resources. Um, I did show you several OpenJ9 features that all you have to do is add an option and you gain so much without doing anything, right? Why wouldn't you take advantage of that? Very easy. Um, so the last thing I want to leave you with is that, um, remember, save, what did I say? Save. <laughs> Save resources, save energy, save money. And the other thing is um, JVMs, you have a choice, okay? So choose wisely. Um, real quick, at the end of this, we have all the links to all the materials I, I presented today. There's some more research links. I think these are available online. And so I want to thank you, and I um, appreciate it. Let me come out to your country.